Okay, so today I'll be talking about getting past first phase with DNA mixtures. True allele is a trademark of cybergenetics. It's a probabilistic genotyping software system. So imagine that you have a mixture, and what you want to do is genotype. And say it's at the FGA locus. What do you know about the genotype before you ever look at the data? Well, what you, would, what you sort of know is that there's a population prevalence that corresponds to how likely each allele pair combination is. And so at FGA, there are about 100 allele pairs. And I've listed them in the table on the left. So those are the allele pairs. And to the right are the allele pair frequencies, uh, 2PQ or P squared. And that would be our prior belief of what a randomly selected person might have as their genotype. I've shown the same data in graphical form instead of as columns, just as on the x-axis, you can see the allele pairs, and there are the probabilities. So that's our prior belief. And now what happens is we see DNA mixture data. And this is, uh, is a major contributor. And suppose our interest is to find the minor contributor at this FGA locus. Well, one of the first rules of Bayes is you want to use all the data if you're going to get a valid result. And so there's, uh, there are peak heights. There are tall peaks, there are short peaks, measured on an RFU scale vertically. The taller peaks correspond to more DNA. There's also a pattern. You can see some taller peaks at 20 and 27 that might correspond to a major contributor, and other smaller peaks to a minor. So you want to use all the data in, in order to do your uh, Bayesian update. How do you update your beliefs? What Bayes' rule tells you is that you want to try out all possible explanations. Here, I'm not showing other things the computer might consider, like stutter, a peak variation, a relative amplification, and so on, but just the basic pairs of alleles. Imagine in blue, you have two allele pairs that are large from the major genotype at a 22, 27. And uh, the computer can hypothesize uh, the amount that you're seeing in blue together with a small amount in orange from a second minor contributor with a 2022 allele pair. That's the one we'll focus on later on when we make a comparison. So if you, if you can imagine the computer putting rectangles of allele pairs, let's assume there are two contributors with large amounts of blue and smaller amounts of orange, putting them in places where they explain the data well in the sense that they cover the data pe peaks, as well as in places where they don't explain the data as well. So there, the blue peaks, the, the model of the explanation has much lower peak heights than blue, and the orange explanation has now moved a rectangle over to the middle by allele uh, 23, where there's no data at all. It's not covering data on the left. This is a worse explanation, and so the likelihood would be lower. And what the computer does is it tries out, essentially, all possibilities, where the data are, where the da data aren't, of different amounts of more and less of these two contributors. And with each comparison, it looks at the data and assesses the likelihood, and it does it for essentially all possible genotype hypotheses. That's shown in the second column of the table. And those numbers are likelihoods. They're numerical measures of how well the genotype explanation explains the data. And one of the concepts of using Bayes is you have to consider all genotype hypotheses. You can't just say, well, I, I kind of like this one, and maybe I'll restrict what I'm looking at to taller peaks or certain peaks. To do it mathematically correct, you have to consider all hypotheses, even where there aren't data. Those numbers are listed in the second column. Again, we'll focus on the first row where the green arrow is on the left. And there's a number there that's 0.14 that is there. And then in green, I'm showing the likelihood function. Uh, next to the brown to the left of it, that was the prior. Now, to stress, this is not a probability of a genotype. This is an explanation of data. But what we really want to know is what is the probability of the genotype. And to do that, we rely on a uh, major theorem in probability that was uh, devised over 250 years ago by the Reverend Thomas Bayes in England that says if you multiply the numbers of what you believed before is your prior, times the likelihood of what the data is telling you the support is, when you look at the product, that's the product in the numerator, 
that's proportional to the posterior probability. In order to make it a probability, you have to divide by the total. That gives you the sum in the bottom. And you end up with the posterior probability, what your belief is afterward based on the data. So I'm now showing that uh, there's a third column that shows the product of likelihood and prior. And if you notice at the bottom of that column, the number is not one. You have to divide all those numbers by that number to renormalize so that in the final column, the numbers do add up to one in the bottom right, and that gives you the posterior probability. So based on this calculation, multiplying the prior column times the likelihood column to get an intermediate product and then dividing to make it all add up to one, that gives you the posterior distribution. You see in this case for allele pair 2022 for a minor contributor to FGA, the number's around 56%. And again, here's a picture of it. There's 56% for 2022 on the left with other possibilities. Those numbers do add up to one because it is a probability. That's how probabilistic genotyping works. Uh, and then when you're done, this probability genotype is, has been objectively inferred. There's no reference individual. There's no suspect. There's no victim. This is working purely ab initio from the data, working out what the probability is at each locus of each contributor. Now, you do want to make a comparison if you have someone to compare with. And that's done by determining match information uh, using a method uh, developed by Alan Turing's group during World War II in the decode of the Enigma machine. This is the machine that does the decoding, not the Enigma machine. It was a German cryptographic code. And that's called the likelihood ratio. Uh, and the likelihood ratio conceptually Imagine you have two hypotheses. Maybe somebody contributed their uh, DNA to evidence, and the alternative is that they didn't. Uh, it's Bayes' theorem for only two alternatives, so you can express it as a ratio, because they can be a numerator and denominator. And what it really measures is how the data that we observe changes our belief. It's a measure of change, the same way you can observe change in energy or change in other quantities in science. This is how the data changes belief. Now, there are many ways to compute this. One of the simplest, first described in 1938 uh, in Essen Mueller's uh, paper on paternity testing, is you can take the, the posterior probability, shown in blue on that first row with a blue oval, divided by the prior probability of the genotype, uh, which is shown in brown, and you get a number like around 50% divided by 5%. And the last column is showing that posterior to prior ratio for all of the listed allele pairs, uh, these nine out of the 100 possibilities. And you see that for some values, the likelihood ratio goes up. For some, it goes down. That's the weight of evidence that supports how probable that 2022 is. In this case, I'm indicating in the red brackets, that number's around 10. That's the change in probability. And you can see that visually as well. Oh, I, I should mention that this is a way of understanding the likelihood ratio, point number four, using simple ratios as opposed to some of the very complex formulas that you can uh, use in, uh, to compute likelihood ratios, but are less intuitive than just taking a ratio of, in this case, the blue bar over the uh, brown bar. And that's selected. See, if this is the first point where we introduce somebody who we're comparing with, and that's an individual with a 2022 allele pair. And you see that's outlined in red. And visually, the ratio of the tall blue to the small brown, the posterior genotype probability to the prior prevalence, uh, gives you that ratio of around 10, which is the likelihood ratio at the locus FGA. And it's also important to make meaningful comparisons if you were using uh, these these sorts of probabilities, and then you went to a different population database. Instead of having 5%, you had 0.5%. You could misstate the likelihood ratio as being 100 because you used the wrong denominator. So you, your comparisons have to be meaningful. You have to compare against what you really started with. NIST is starting to uh, teach the community about Bayes' theorem and probabilistic genotyping. They're giving a lot of uh, webcasts and seminars. and the, they're very good at this. They're not experts in this area. Uh, they make a few minor mistakes, and they published, uh, they did post them after the webinar on the website. Uh, we found a few other mistakes that we 
uh, posted as well. You can Google NIST true allele corrections. It's all very minor. The major difference had to do with the confusion between likelihood and posterior probability. So if you just change the table that they showed to all the previous slides in the talk with a table that are correct, that will be a correction to update your belief in a good Bayesian way about what it was they meant to say. So Bayes for beginners has some basic rules. You want to use all the data. Uh, the reason thresholds don't work, as we've been hearing repeatedly in this meeting, is because they don't use all the data. So once you go beyond simple two-person mixtures, there's no expectation that using real probability like Bayes' theorem, they would work. You need to consider all genotype hypotheses. If you don't consider everything that could be, even if you don't see it in the data, you won't handle phenomena like dropout and such objectively. You don't want to confuse likelihood with probability. Uh, likelihood is the, is the chance of seeing evidence under different conditions, whereas probability is your updated belief in the genotype itself. Uh, it's good when you're explaining, particularly in courts, to use simple ratios and not complex formulas, and to make meaningful comparisons, particularly between posterior and prior. So now that the community seems to be given a mandate uh, by NIST, which I think is wonderful to bring probabilistic genotyping into the lab and courtroom to preserve more of the evidence information that's present in biological samples. There's a task in front of you. In the lab, uh, you need to understand Bayesian update. So we took a first step there. Uh, you need to unlearn everything you ever learned about qualitative peak thresholds. That's sort of harder for older people, over 25. And then you have to learn quantitative genotype modeling. Okay. At some point, you have to, whatever software you get, you have to train to use it, get certified. You have to validate the genotyping system, which can be a lot of work. And you have to develop standard operating procedures. Then you're finally ready to go to court, maybe a year or two later. And you have to succeed in your admissibility hearings, write case reports, prepare trial materials, educate uh, trial attorneys explain the LR clearly to jurors and judges and answer cross-exam questions. So I'm pleased to say that currently two groups are up and running in the U.S. with a probabilistic genotyping system. Kern County in California uh, is running, I think, uh, 200 um, mixture interpretation questions a day on their true allele system. Virginia uh, Department of Forensic Science issued their first case reports uh, two or three weeks ago. And they're up and running. New York State, I think, is poised to go live next month. And for all these groups and others, to get them to first base, Cybergenetics, which has uh, a lot of experience in probabilistic genotyping, work with them. They came to us and they said, we need to learn about all this material. So we had courses for them, practical courses in problem solving. Uh, once that was underway, they needed to do validation studies. And we've uh, the most recent paper is uh, in JFS in November with New York State. Uh, but we do validation after validation. And the reason is to understand the system. They have to update their knowledge about what is it that DNA is now doing? How reliable are these systems? What do the data mean? Uh, they go to court with invisibility hearings. And I, I've been there with them testifying, helping to get their validated systems on board. And then uh, when they go to trial, they need some experience, so I testified, I think, 10 times between Virginia and California in those two jurisdictions. And now they've seen enough, and Virginia has already testified twice uh, in their own trials. So there's a mechanism, and there's a lot of support, and I'm sure that Dr. Kevin Miller from uh, Kern or Dr. Susan Greenspoon from uh, Virginia would be happy as resources, to be resources in the community if you want to know how to get everything done you need to go live with whatever system you end up getting. In addition to that, we have a wealth of information on our website with most of our course materials that are not directly student interactive up there uh, as reading materials and as videos. Uh, we have uh, presentations like this one, usually uploaded within a week if you want to watch a video of it or if your friends missed it. And our publications, validation papers, introductory materials, magazine articles, conference papers, and so on are up there. And uh, finally, we introduced a YouTube channel with over 50 uh, tutorial videos uh, a month or two ago. Thank you very much.